Welcome back to Aurora Tech Channel. Today, I'm going to test out a super cute tiny CNC machine, the Kubico from Sane Smart. It might look like a toy, but surprisingly, it's a pretty capable machine. This machine is fully enclosed with a working area of 150 by 110 millimeters and a Z travel of 40 millimeters. Its footprint is compact, requiring about 330 by 330 millimeters of table space, including room for the screen and power supply connector. The height is approximately 320 millimeters. It comes with a 75 watt spindle, similar to what is commonly found on budget 30 18 CNC machines. The chuck is a standard ER11 with a 1 8 inch collet. The X and Y axis use 10 millimeter linear rods, while the Z axis uses 8 millimeter rods. All lead screws are 8 millimeters, and the stepper motors are NEMA 17. The machine includes a 2 inch screen that functions as an offline controller, allowing you to copy files to an SD card and run jobs without a computer. It also has Wi Fi, but this only works with the mobile or tablet app, which operates similarly to the screen interface. There are two standout features typically seen only on higher end machines. The first is the tool height gauge, which lets you set tool height automatically when switching tools instead of manually using paper. The second is the height map feature, similar to auto bed leveling on a 3D printer, which compensates for uneven materials to achieve more precise engraving. In this video, I'll test various materials, wood, acrylic, aluminum, and PCB to see what this machine is capable of. I would like to thank Sane Smart for sending us this machine and sponsoring today's video. As always, even though this is a sponsored review, we won't hold back from pointing out any cons. With that said, let's get started. The machine came in a retail box protected by super thick foam that acts like an inner case. The whole unit was placed inside a bag so you can lift it up easily, and all tools and accessories were packed neatly in custom cut foam inside the machine. It came with a detachable cover, some tools, sample bits, testing materials, soft pads, and a power supply. The clamps, screws, USB drive, and probe were packed in a separate box. There's nothing to assemble, just stick four soft pads underneath the machine. It came with a few engraving bits and drills. I started by installing one of the engraving bits. The collet is a standard ER11 chuck with a 1 8 inch collet. Just insert the bit and tighten it using the included wrenches. After powering on, I home the machine using the home button and all axes moved as expected. The two inch screen is tiny, but includes everything you need. One thing we need to set up is the tool height gauge at the back. Its surface is slightly lower than the bed, so we need to calibrate the height difference to make it work accurately. Go to the calibration menu. There are two options, and we'll choose Z-Probe to calibrate the tool height gauge. It shows a message to connect the clip of the probe to the bed. Technically, this isn't necessary at this step since the first trigger is just the bit touching the gauge, but I followed the instructions anyway. Next, it shows a message to clip the crocodile clamp onto the bit, forming a circuit when the bit touches the bed. The machine then displays a height difference of negative 0.594 millimeters, which we can save. I actually probed the tool height gauge 12 times and recorded values ranging from 0.593 to 0.633, resulting in a total range of 0.040 millimeters. That's still quite accurate, at least slightly more precise than using a sheet of copy paper to set the tool height, since paper is generally thicker than 0.05 millimeters and relying on the feel of drag introduces additional uncertainty. Okay, let's go back to our first test. I will start with this three millimeter plywood. As the tool height gauge is calibrated, we can now use the probe button to set the Z height. By default, the probe speed is 200 millimeters per minute, which is pretty slow, but I'll leave it that way since slower probing gives a more accurate value. I'll also enter the thickness of the plywood so it adds to the bed height. I slide the plywood under the bit, and it seems the tool height gauge is working as it just barely touches the plywood. Then I'll use the screen to jog the tool head to the starting position. I normally use the lower left corner. Once positioned, we can set the X and Y working positions to zero, and you'll see the on-screen values update. I will use Fusion 360 to generate the tool path to engrave a logo on this plywood. The feed rate is set to 200 millimeters per minute and the depth is one millimeter. The preview looks good. I will then copy the file to the micro SD card and start it on the screen. After selecting the file, just press the start button. We'll follow the G code, so let's keep all values at 100% and start the job. Thank you. 
Let's do a sound test. The sound meter is about one foot away. When the machine is not enclosed, the sound level stays in the low 60s and occasionally jumps to the high 60s. When fully enclosed, it stays in the mid to high 50s, which is pretty quiet, not far from a regular 3D printer. The job finishes in about seven and a half minutes. After vacuuming the debris, the result is not bad, but the edges need some cleanup. I will repeat the job one more time as a cleanup pass. After the cleanup pass, it looks much better, so everything seems to be working quite well right out of the box. Next, I'll try cutting solid poplar wood. I placed a piece of MDF underneath to protect the aluminum bed since we're going to cut through this one quarter inch poplar. I also 3D printed a few extra clamps as the machine only came with two. To set the Z height, I used the tool height gauge and entered the combined thickness of the poplar and MDF, which is about 8.5 millimeters. The probing result was quite accurate, aligning closely with the top surface of the material. I then raised the Z axis slightly using the touchscreen and jogged to the starting position. For this test, I will start by engraving a Gryffindor logo, followed by a cleanup pass, and finally a contour operation to cut through the wood. The initial engraving took two passes and finished in 20 minutes and 44 seconds. A cleanup pass was definitely necessary, as a lot of debris was trapped in the engraved areas. After running just one cleanup pass, which took around 10 minutes, the result looked much better. I then switched to a flat end mill, reset the Z height using the gauge, and ran the contour cut. It finishes in eight minutes and 27 seconds. The edges were clean and required no sanding. The machine handled the poplar very well, so next I moved on to acrylic. As before, I placed a piece of MDF underneath the acrylic. I plan to engrave a Hello Kitty design, run a cleanup pass, and then cut out the piece with a contour operation. To secure the small acrylic piece, I made a few more 3D printed clamps of different lengths. For the engraving, I set a depth of 0.5 millimeters, which required four passes and finished in just under 10 minutes. The result looked clean enough that a cleanup pass may not have been necessary, but since it only takes about two to three minutes per pass, I ran one anyway. The cleanup took less than two minutes and as expected, didn't make a big visual difference due to the already clean engraving. After that, 
I switched to the flatten mill, used the tool height gauge again to set the Z height, and ran the contour cut. Acrylic tends to scatter debris, so it would be better to place the enclosure cover on. The job finished in 3 minutes and 16 seconds. I'm very happy with the result. The Hello Kitty tag came out clean, both in the engraving and the cut. Let's try some more challenging materials. I was looking for 3mm aluminum but ran out, so the thinnest I have is 5mm. Let's see if this tiny machine can handle it. I'll try cutting a wrench out of it, keeping the feed rate at 100mm per minute, and the depth of cut at just 0.5mm. For a machine of this size, I don't expect it to cut aluminum quickly. As long as it can cut, that's good enough. I enclosed the machine to check the noise level again, and surprisingly it stayed in the low 60s, which is quite acceptable for metal cutting. I did make a mistake when generating the toolpath. As you can see, it started cutting from the inside, which caused one corner of the wrench to be missing. After checking Infusion 360, I realized it was my error. I should have had it cut from the outside so the lead-in point would be from the top and outside edge of the wrench. Still, this doesn't affect the demonstration of the machine's aluminum cutting capability. The job took 4 hours and 40 minutes to complete. Despite the small error, it actually looks not too bad. The edges are rougher compared to larger machines, but the result still exceeded my expectations. Finally, I'll try making a PCB. I actually started drawing PCB using Microsoft Paint. I learned this from an old website I bookmarked many years ago. I'll use that same example here. I imported the image into Fusion 360 and traced the lines for engraving. Then I'll run a second operation to switch to a drill bit and make some holes. I mounted the PCB on the machine and placed a piece of MDF underneath since I'll be drilling through the board. I'll also try the height map feature, which is similar to auto leveling in 3D printing. First, I created a new height map using the screen. It requires connecting the probe clips to the bit and the material, which I've already done. I've also moved the tool to the starting position, then I set the PCB size to 80 by 50 millimeters and chose an 8 by 5 grid, which will probe 40 points. It starts probing the material, just like a 3D printer does during bed leveling. Once that's done, I can start the engraving job. I set the engraving depth to 0.05 millimeters, but it looks slightly deeper than expected. We'll see if it still works. After that, I'll switch to a drill bit to make the holes. I will also sand the surface to smooth it out. Normally, I would start with 400 grit sandpaper and finish with 1000 grit, but I only had 220 grit available, so the surface is a bit rough. 
The engraving came out deeper than I planned, and using a higher quality bit would likely improve the result. It's not perfect, but it should still work. Okay, let's talk about the pros and cons of this machine, starting with the pros. 1. This machine is tiny, but using 10mm linear rods makes it more rigid than a typical 3018. I didn't expect it to mill 5mm aluminum so well. It doesn't shake or vibrate wildly like a 3018 or other machines in this price range. 2. With the enclosure, the machine is very quiet. Even when cutting metal, the noise level remains comparable to that of a high-speed 3D printer. 3. The offline controller is handy. It allows you to run jobs without a PC. I'm not a fan of using G-code senders. Whether I've used Candle or UGS in the past, I've encountered various issues, especially with jobs that run for hours. In contrast, this screen has been reliable even during the nearly five hour aluminum wrench cutting job. Four, the tool height gauge is quite accurate with a variation range of about 0.04 millimeters. It's not ultra precise, but I still think it's much better than using a piece of paper and relying on the feel of the bit dragging across it. Five, other features like dual limit switches on all axes and the phone app are nice additions. The height map is also a great feature, but we'll talk more about that in the cons section. Now for the cons, one, the offline controller works reliably. However, the user interface can be a bit confusing. For example, there's a physical probe button, and the menu also has a probe option. Both refer to the same function, which is fine. But under the calibration menu, there's another probe option that refers to setting the height difference between the tool height gauge and the bed. Once you figure it out, it's manageable. But having everything labeled probe can be a bit misleading. Two, the physical arrow button on the screen is used to navigate the menu, but it only works with up and down. However, when moving the Z axis, it switches to using left and right, where left moves down and right moves up. This kind of button design is a bit puzzling and makes me scratch my head. 3. There's no protection for the gaps at the base, so debris can still get into the bottom, and you may need to open the bottom cover occasionally for cleaning. 4. Wi-Fi is only available when using their phone app. Since we still need to generate G-codes on a computer, it would be more practical to have a web interface for file uploads, then start the G-code using the offline controller. 5. When setting the height map, the machine uses the bit itself to set the Z offset, which I believe should be even more accurate than using the tool height gauge. However, when engraving a PCB right after applying the height map, the depth turned out deeper than the 0.05 mm specified in the G-code. The quality of the PCB and the sample engraving bit may be contributing factors, but I think some firmware tweaks are still needed to achieve better results. In conclusion, the Cubico CNC exceeded my expectations. I didn't expect it to be able to cut a wrench out of 5mm thick aluminum. It's a surprisingly capable machine, especially at this price point. If you're looking to get into CNC machining without making a big investment up front, this is an excellent option. I included a link to the machine in the video description. It has also earned a spot on my recommendation list at auroratechchannel.com as the best beginner CNC machine. My website also tracks prices of major 3D printers, laser engravers, and CNC machines to help you find great deals. That's it for this video. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.